was Serge Kusevitsky? What impact did he have in the music world? And most importantly, does he haunt us to this day? What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and this is part of a new series I'm entitling Who Were These People or something like that. If you can think of a better name, leave it in the comments below. In this series, we're taking a deep dive into the people that shaped the double bass, and today, that's right, Serge Kusevitsky. <laughs> Serge Kusevitsky was born in 1874, about 250 kilometers northwest of Moscow. He came from a family of professional musicians, and Serge started on the viola at age six before moving on to the cello. At age 14, he received a scholarship to the Musico Dramatic Institute of the Moscow Philharmonic, where he began studying the bass in earnest. His main bass teacher was Yosef Rambazek, who had studied at the Prague Conservatory with Yosef Rabe in the 1860s. That Czech influence explains why Kusevitsky played German bow instead of the French bow, which is more common in Russia at the time. Kusevitsky began to attract attention as a bass soloist. For his first performance in St. Petersburg, one critic wrote that the concert was a seminar on double bass playing. People like to compare Kusevitsky's playing to other prominent bass players of the day, with Kusevitsky pretty much always coming out on top. In 1900, Franz Simondel, who taught at the Vienna Conservatory, played an arrangement of an oboe concerto by Handel. The reviews were not so hot. A few days later, Kusevitsky played a recital featuring the exact same Handel concerto, and there was much talk in Moscow music circles about Kusevitsky having shown up Simondel. <laughs> Kusevitsky's playing was compared to the great violinists Gisey and Chrysler, and many people commented on his wide range of tone colors, comparing his playing to famous singers and instrumentals of the time, including Pablo Casals. In 1902, Kusevitsky traveled with other Russian soloists to play in Germany's famous Bayreuth Theater, which led to ever-increasing concert opportunities throughout Europe. Kusevitsky played only transcriptions when soloing with an orchestra, generally playing the Mozart Bassoon Concerto and Kol Nidre by Max Bruch. Kusevitsky also composed a few short pieces for bass and piano, and then there's his bass concerto. Seems like there's controversy surrounding every major bass concerto. Research indicates that while Kusevitsky wrote the actual music for this, his friend and colleague Reinhold Glier most likely did the orchestration. Regardless, Kusevitsky is reported to never have actually played the piece with orchestra, playing the bass and piano version exclusively. Think about that the next time you're struggling with balancing the bass part with the heavy orchestration for this piece. The specter of Bottazzini loomed large in Europe at the time, and rather than embrace that composer's showboater pyrotechnical works, Kusevitsky went in a different direction, choosing works that focused on expressive musical lines and mature musical ideas. In 1905, Kusevitsky went to Berlin to study conducting and he became friends with many Russian exiles, including Sergei Rachmaninoff. Kusevitsky's home actually became a meeting point for the artistic avant-garde of the time. Even while studying conducting, Kusevitsky kept up his solo bass career, and he even founded the Russian Music Publishing House in 1909, with the goal being independence of composers from publishers through cutting out the publishers to promote economic independence for composers and thus serve the cause of a successful development of musical creativity. Sounds like we musicians have been struggling with these issues for a very long time. In 1909, Kusevitsky played a concert attended by Leo Tolstoy, who then invited Kusevitsky and the other musicians to his home, where, at Tolstoy's request, Kusevitsky played a recital for him. Not much is known about Kusevitsky's bass teaching career. He took over his former teacher's post as bass professor of the Moscow Philharmonic Society, and he held bass seminars throughout Europe. He also worked for many years on his own double bass method, though the draft was left in Moscow when Kusevitsky left in 1920 and no one knows if it still exists. Interestingly, we've got this one archival recording of Kusevitsky. It 
was recorded in 1929, well after his heyday as a bass soloist. And it certainly has some dated glissandi stylings and such, but it's kind of incredible to hear his tone and phrasing from almost 100 years ago. In 1917, Kusevitsky's conducting career was really taking off, with him being named music director of St. Petersburg's Imperial Theater. This time in history, of course, was quite chaotic in Russia and worldwide, and Kusevitsky left what had then become the Soviet Union in 1920, heading to Berlin, then Paris, and finally moving to the United States in 1924, where he would become the conductor of the Boston Symphony and remain in that post until 1949. In 60, the second and the third bass a crescendo, and then we will begin here with the string quartet, we will have the right balance. If we need uh, 55. As you dig more and more into Kusevitsky's life, you realize what a huge impact he had on the entire course of musical history. I mean, he conducted premieres galore by composers like Prokofiev and Stravinsky. He even contracted Maurice Ravel to orchestrate Mussorgsky's pictures in an exhibition. Though we don't know much about Kusevitsky's bass teaching background, his influence as a conductor has been documented extensively. One of his students described Kusevitsky's influence like this. A great teacher is one who can light a spark in you, the spark that sets you on fire with enthusiasm for music or whatever you happen to be studying. Someone who can light sparks in his students, sparks which their enthusiasm for music or whatever subject they are studying can nurture until they become flames. That student was none other than Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein gave a talk about Kusevitsky at one of his young people's concerts. I want to begin with a teacher who is still one of the strongest influences in my life, even though he has already been dead for 12 years. I refer to Serge Kusevitsky. I'm not sure how many of you young people know that famous name, but you certainly ought to, because he was one of the greatest conductors of all time, and for 25 years led the magnificent Boston Symphony Orchestra to a position where it came to be known as the finest orchestra in the world. Perhaps as a result of his connection with Kusevitsky, Leonard Bernstein elevated the bass to an even higher level, bringing to prominence the person who would take the mantle of the world's greatest double bass soloist. Gary Carr is only 20 years old. His instrument is a madly difficult and unusual one for solo playing, the double bass, believe it or not. Have you ever heard a double bass recital? I doubt it. I don't know when I've ever heard anything like it since the great conductor Kusevitsky, who was my teacher and who was famous all over the world as a double bass soloist before he became a conductor. I believe that young Mr. Carr is on his way to being another Kusevitsky. Kusevitsky had passed away by the time Gary Carr played his New York City debut recital in 1962, but his widow, Olga Kusevitsky, was in the audience. Now, here's what you might not be expecting. According to Olga, during the concert, she saw the ghost of her late husband appear and embrace Gary Carr while he was playing. Olga interpreted this as a sign that Gary was meant to play that bass. And a few days later, she presented to Gary what was then thought to be an Amati bass and has now become known as the Carr Kusevitsky bass. And this is the bass that Gary played for decades. <laughs> The Kusevitsky ghost story surrounding this bass has persisted, and it's come up several times in interviews I've done over the years. Psychics have seen Kusevitsky's ghost, and they all describe the same character. This long button-down coat with white gloves on. Gary kind of knows that he's there, but he's never seen this spirit. But he and Armin were playing up at Saranac, up at Tanglewood. They were doing a concert, and there's a big room there that has Kusevitsky's portrait at one end of the room next to the piano. And... They were doing this concert with the Amadi. Gary said he couldn't stop playing. It's like it was a rehearsal, but just didn't want to stop playing. There was something that compelled him to just keep playing. Well, when they finally did take a break, Gary went to put the bass and just lean it on the chair. And it's almost like it fell onto the chair, but it didn't. It didn't drop. It was taken out of his hands. And Harmon saw it, too, and said, it was really weird because he saw it leave Gary's hands, but it didn't 
drop and fall onto the chair. It was taken out of his hands and placed on the chair. In 2004, Gary donated this historic base to the International Society of Bassists, and it has been loaned out to bass shops ever since for bassists to play recitals on. In 2006, Aaron Riley of the Guarneri House loaned me the base for a recital in Chicago, which I've got some hilariously grainy camera footage of. I had no ghost encounters, though I did have a scary moment when I was caught in a massive rainstorm and had to hightail it home to get the case off before it soaked through. It was a really cool experience to play this bass. Heck, I even wrote an article about it for Bass World back in the day. It was also a little scary to look out in the audience and see most of the Chicago Symphony and Lyric Opera bass sections out there. Not really to see me, but to see that bass. One big takeaway was how small this bass is compared to my orchestra cannon. I could practically fit Kusevitsky's old bass inside of my bass. Another big takeaway for me was, unless I played really close to the bridge, the bass didn't really sound that good under my ear. Once I got up on that bridge, the bass came alive and it sent the sound out and it got me thinking, Gary Carr has a reputation of playing a lot closer to the bridge than most players. So was it the bass? Or was it Gary? Kusevitsky's influence lives on in so many different ways. He commissioned all those pieces. He had that impact on Leonard Bernstein, who then influenced so many people. His bass was gifted to Gary Carr, who then went on to have a huge solo career and influence so many more people. Kusevitsky's concerto and short pieces have been played worldwide countless times. And Kusevitsky and his legacy have really elevated the status of the bass, not only in the bass world, but in the music world in general. By the way, if you want to check out the complete video of any of these clips or check out the articles that I used to research this video that's all linked in the description below. Thank you so much for watching this video. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and you might be interested in checking out my deep dive on Dragonetti, which is kind of in a similar vein. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.